me. Well, we're going to be in uh, Leviticus, so if you want to uh, go there, you can find, if you don't have a Bible, you can get one in the chair in front of you. Um, and we're going to be looking at um, chapter 25. So let me say this, that um, one of the most difficult things, I think, to separate ourselves from in general um, is a sense of being an individual um, because our entire world, particularly in America, is all about being an individual. Um, I was talking to somebody about this the other day about um, it used to be when you had um, a child, particularly for women, um, it used to be that there was a community that would help you raise that child. And ultimately, now it's like moms are by themselves and it makes it seem as if uh, their lives get completely ruined and it, and it would be true that your life would be ruined if you had a baby if you were by yourself, right? But it's not really meant, we're not really meant to be by ourselves. And what ha ends up happening is um, we find ourselves um, often wanting to live in this world that's teaching us to be uh, by ourselves when really there's this sake of community, right? And what if we don't know, I mean, in terms of identity, if we don't know that we belong to a kingdom, then our decisions all get messed up, right? Our decisions get skewed, the, the way we make decisions. So when you think of yourself as an individual, you make different decisions than if you think of yourself as part of a community, don't you think? So the idea here is the Bible gives us really practical examples of what that would look like if we were in a community um, and we saw ourselves as not people of this world, but people of the kingdom of God, then we would make different decisions, particularly with our stuff, particularly with our things. So in terms of identity, we have to understand who we truly are and where we belong for us to really make good decisions. Does that make sense? Is everybody following that? Okay, so even though Leviticus 25 is really about the sabbatical year, um, you have to think of it as, um, sorry, I'm still getting a bunch of feedback. I'm not sure where that's coming from. Do you guys hear that? It's kind of doing something weird. Maybe I'm standing in a bad spot. Should I hold it closer? Too much bass. No, that's just my voice, Will. My voice is so bassy. They can't, they can't even fix it. They can't. <laughs> no, I wish that was true. I wish I had. Yeah. Do you remember Robbie Kellogg? Remember his dad uh, on, uh, at night on the radio? Do you guys remember that? Um, his dad just passed away. If you listen to Moody, his dad would do that uh, uh, Bible through the night program. You remember that program? He had that really deep voice. He'd read the Bible. Yeah, not me. Okay, so think about it this way, that often if you find yourself, um, if you find yourself struggling or you look at the world and you're wondering what's in it for me, then you're probably not kingdom minded, right? If you're, if you're looking at situations and you're wondering, like, how do I preserve my stuff, then you're probably not kingdom minded, right? So there's this sense here that he gives us these rules and these rules are funny because there are people who want the Bible to be Republican Right? And then there are people who want the Bible to be Democrat. And then there's even people who want the Bible to sound like, um, like they're communist. Or there's people, right? people have all these different things. But ultimately, the Bible really is its own thing. And it's dependent on two things that are super important. One, that there's a king. And two, that there's a community of people that are a part of his kingdom. And if you forget that and you try to read the Bible any other way, if you try to shove a president or a parliament or a dictator in, it doesn't work. Right? You have to have a king who sits on the throne, and we have to remember that if there's a king who sits on the throne, then we are the servants in that kingdom. So Leviticus gives us a way of living in that kingdom, particularly for a group of people who used to be slaves and now they're free. Right? So verse chapter uh, 25 in Leviticus, chapter, uh, uh, chapter 25, verse 1, it says, The Lord then spoke to Moses at Mount Sinai, saying, Speak to the sons of Israel and say to them, Now notice, they're still at Mount Sinai. Right? So they're not where they're going to be. They haven't received the inheritance yet. They're just getting the rules for when they get the inheritance. So you have to imagine that before your great-grandfather dies, he come, the lawyer calls you to a meeting, and he says, listen, you guys are going to get an inheritance, but before you get the inheritance, here's the rules for what you're going to do with that inheritance. You following? Okay. So he says, six years you shall sow the field, and six years you shall prune your vineyard and gather in its crop. But during the seventh year, the land shall have a Sabbath rest, a Sabbath to the Lord, and you shall not sow your field nor prune your vineyard. 
right? So this is interesting because he's saying, when you get there, here's a rule that I want you to follow, that every seven years I want you let, to let the land rest. And not just let the land rest, but let the land rest in a way where you don't even take care of it, right? And that makes it almost impossible. And I don't know if, you're, if you've done gardening or not, but if you just let your garden go for a year, it gets pretty messy, right? Things just sort of grow up, all sorts of things. But he's saying, listen, for a year, you need to let me take care of it. And, now, and for an entire year, you have to eat the produce that you've already taken from other, of other times, right? So he builds it in to our system that we have to understand rest, we have to understand Sabbath, and if we don't understand rest and we don't understand Sabbath, the land's going to need it. In fact, all of creation needs rest, right? Have you ever noticed that every animal sleeps, right? Every animal takes pauses. Um, I mean, even sharks who kind of don't take naps, they just kind of float there for a while, right? I mean, everything needs to rest. So he's saying, listen, if you won't understand rest, I've built it into creation so that the creation will desire a rest, right? And, and for you to understand that, I want it to be a part of how you actually think about the world, how you think about the kingdom. So when you get your inheritance, know that, remember, because Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and then Jacob had 12 sons, and those 12 sons all represent different tribes, and they all got a different inheritance within the land. He's saying, when you get there, I want you to remember who you are, who you serve, what kingdom you're a part of, and that kingdom lets and understands rest. Okay, you following? So he says, so, all of, uh, this is verse 6, all of you shall have Sabbath products of the land for food, yourselves, your male and female slaves, uh, your hired man, your foreign resident, those who, and the aliens who live among you. Even your cattle and your animals that are in the land shall have uh, all of its crops to eat. You are also uh, to count off seven Sabbaths of years for yourselves, seven times seven years, so that you will have times of seven Sabbaths of years, namely 49 years. So he's saying every seven years, when you get to the seventh of the seven, add an extra year. So there's actually two years where we're not supposed to move, uh, prune things. And, and you go, Jake, what are you even talking about, Rabbi? What's the point of this, right? He's trying to teach us to live in a kingdom. Because remember, we used to be slaves. And we're used to not, we don't stop working. And even when we're out of resources, we continue to work. And we had 400 years of slavery put on us. And now he's trying to strip that away. And he's saying, when you live in my kingdom, you get rest. When you live in my kingdom, you can rely on me. And you don't have to rely on you or your stuff. I mean, think about how, how important that is. That as people who are kingdom minded, we have to remember that our reliance is not on the things of this world. They're on the king of kings and we belong to his kingdom. Do you see what, he's trying to get along this idea that, so the rule is, you're not supposed to do this every seven years. And by the way, you can translate this into money because for them, this is, they didn't have necessarily money, they had crops, right? So he's saying, listen, I will give you enough if you rely on me to get you through, and it goes with the Torah portion, through the lean years, right? Through the years of plenty and through the years of not. And even when we don't know what's coming, like with Joseph and his brothers, God always has a plan and always knows what he's doing and is always moving the pieces around. That when you belong to a kingdom that can't be shaken, then no matter what's going on in your life, it changes the decisions that you make. Because when you're in crisis, right? Um, I just, I watched this new movie. It was crazy about kind of the end of the world. Um, I thought it was actually pretty good in terms of people turning on themselves. Um, and I thought to myself that that's probably really true. That um, because in our last crisis, which wasn't even that bad of a crisis, people started wanting to kill each other over toilet paper, right? You remember that, right? I mean, I, people were killing each other over whether they had um, uh, some paper over their face or not, right? So what if it got really bad, right? And to me, what I saw was that I, and what I was completely disappointed in is that the believers turned on each other instead of relying on God, no matter what was going on. Right? And in our congregation, we spent a lot of time saying, forget what's going on in the world, focus on the gospel, because the gospel has gotten us through. The good news that there's a king on the throne, the good news that you're a part of a kingdom, will get us through this situation, and it'll get us through the next situation. And it's gotten through us all the situations we've been through. Right? I mean, when the young people literally go to an empty concentration camp, they will see that no matter what man meant for evil, God could turn to good. Right? No matter what, that's as much evil, I think, as anyone has ever experienced in this world, but we're still here. God has still pr provided. God has still given to us, right? So there's this sense that in those times, right? So he wants us to understand this so much so 
that he, pl he, he, he puts it into the high holidays. Remember, so God has appointed times, and a part of those appointed times is every 50 years on the Day of Atonement, right, which is verse 9, we're supposed to sound a ram's horn, and on the 10th day of the 7th month, on the Day of Atonement, you shall sound the shofar all throughout the land. So you blow the shofar, it's sort of a warning, and it's sort of a, a, a celebration, because really there are two things, remember we said with shofars that happen, either the king's on his way, there's some kind of battle, really there's really three, and the third one is, uh, the gates are open, you're being set free, something is happening, right? It's an alert. So he's saying, every 50 years I want you to blow the shofar on the Day of Atonement, which by the way, if you think about it as a tangent, just as a slight tangent, that, that's a funny time to set the captives free. Right? Because Yom Kippur is all about our sin. Right? So we go, we go back to what we were saying with the time of refreshing. In a time, somehow God can set us free, even at the time where we're focusing on our sin. I mean, it's kind of not like the way the world sets things up. Normally the world says, why don't you feel better first and then we'll talk about it. Right? But the Bible's saying, no, I want you on the day that you're fasting, on the day that you afflict yourselves, on the day that you remember that you didn't do as good as you thought you did this year, that's when the shofar is going to blast, and that's the reminder that you've been set free. You've been set free not only from the lies of the devil, you've been set free from, the sin, from sin itself. So then all of a sudden Yom Kippur becomes a celebration, and we celebrate that we are sinners who've been set free from slavery. Right? So what he does is he takes Yom Kippur, and he attaches it to Passover. I mean, isn't that kind of funny? that God is kind of making these cycles over and over and over so that as we practice, look, we do some silly things in our, our congregation. Like we point with our pinky, which I know some of you don't like, right, at the Torah. That's not for you. That's for the kids so that when somebody comes to them and says, here's the Torah, they'll say, no, that's not it. I've seen it, and that's not it. Because every week I point to one, and I know exactly what it is, the five books of Moses, not what you're adding to it. Right? When they say, this is the word of God, you can go, no, I don't think so. I'm pretty sure that that guy found that in upstate New York and he translated it through some weird hieroglyphics in a hat. That's not the Bible. Right? That's Mormonism, in case you're wondering. Right? So, you, we say, this is the Torah. We go, no, it's not. Because we know and we repeat it. And why do we repeat it? We repeat it over and over so that it becomes part of them. So that as they're thinking about it, so that they literally, it comes out of their bottle, but out of their, uh, well, bottles too, but out of their bodies, Right? Um, Josiah just started wrestling. Um, and one of the hardest things when you start wrestling is to learn how to sprawl. And I've talked to you probably about this before. Um, but sprawling is if somebody comes at your legs, you're supposed to, with muscle memory, because it has to be faster than the person coming at you, you have to flatten your body out and smash their face into the, into the mat. Right? You have to practice so much that when somebody comes at your legs at all, you instantly throw your body back and smash them down. Right? It has to be drilled into you. It has to be like liturgical, right? It has to be over and over. So every seven years, every, we practice. Every 50 years, we celebrate that we've been set free. And what it does is it reminds us that we belong to a king and we belong to a kingdom. You follow? Okay, verse 10, it says, Thus you shall consecrate the 50th day, proclaim a release throughout the land of all of its inhabitants, and you shall be a jubilee to you, and each of you shall return to his own property, and each of you shall return to his family. Now this is where it gets complicated, because how, after 50 years of lots of stuff happening, do you get to return back to your family? That only is dependent on the fact that you would have to have an inheritance, and that, herit that inheritance has to be unbreakable, right? That God has given you something he has promised you something, and even if you mess it up, you should be able to go back to it, which means that the community has to be able to preserve it so that it's there when you go back, right? Which means that it's not about you, it's about the community. It's never about us. It's never about us as an individual, and in fact, I think that we've lost sight of it when we become individuals, that it's about the kingdom, and there's a king on the throne. You follow me? So then he says this, right? Go down to verse 14. He says, If you make a sale, moreover, to a friend or buy it from a friend's hand, you shall not do wrong to one another. And I think this is one of the funniest rules in the Bible. Because he's essentially saying is, is when you sell to your brother something, don't mess, it, don't mess it up by doing something wrong to them. Now, to me, you only need those kinds of rules when God knows that when people sell things to each other, they rip each other off. 
All you have to do is watch Shark Tank to know that every time you buy something, they are multiplying what they sold by many, many times, right? They love it. You watch those sharks, right? They sit there, if you've ever watched the show, and they say, how much does it cost to make that little widget? And they go, oh, it costs us 16 cents. Okay, how much do you sell for? $29.95. They all jump in their seat, right? Why? Because they go, oh my gosh, we would hope that you would get a three-time multiplier for what you're building so that you could make, you know, with the shipping and the people in between and all that, you'd be able to pay all your people and still make a profit. But you're making like 200% profit. That's something I want to invest in, right? That's worldly thinking. Because what they're trying to do is make their money make more money, which in itself is not necessarily bad, right? But they're not thinking about how do I make, how, are we brothers and sisters in the same kingdom? Now, as believers, when we sell to one another, we have to be even more careful, according to Scripture, that we don't do it wrong. Now, I don't know, but oddly enough, I think this is actually usually where we mess up the most. On Yom Kippur, when we get to all of the list and we read through the list, right? We do the al and we read through. The one where we, every year somebody comes to me and says, are you saying I shouldn't charge my brother interest? And I go, it says it over and over. They go, well, I mean, but I lent it to him, and I can't make, not make my money back. And I think then you're not thinking about the kingdom. Because the whole point of a loan is to help somebody who's in trouble get back to their inheritance. And if you believe that they have an inheritance like you have an inheritance, then you're not loaning them money to make money. You're loaning them money so that they can get back to what God already gave them. Because they are the servants who belong to the Lord just like you are. Right? And if I'm a servant and you're a servant, that the whole point of a loan is to get you back from wherever you went. Right? So he says, don't do it wrong. So kingdom-focused people know how to do it right. Right? If you're kingdom-focused, then you know how to do it right. And it says, you shall not, and then it says, keep going, verse, uh, you shall buy from your friend. He is selling to you according to the number of years of crops. In proportion to the extent of the years, you shall increase his price. And in proportion to the fewness of the years, you shall diminish the price. For it's the number of crops he is selling. He's saying, literally, base it on the year of Jubilee. As you get closer, make it cheaper. That's not how we do it in the United States. As there is more demand, we make the price higher. Just go buy some gas, right? Why is it that the prices got higher over COVID, but they never came back down? Because somebody figured out we're willing to pay because we need it, right? Is that doing it right? Is that thinking about the kingdom or is that thinking about the person who owns the business, right? And then I know someone's going to come and say to me, yeah, but I mean, being a good businessman is knowing where to do this. And I go, you're right. When you're just selling to somebody you don't know, and that's the problem is you don't know anybody. If you were in community, if you were in a community of people that you loved, if you cared about that community and you believed that you were a servant just like they were in the kingdom of God, then the reason you'd be selling to them was to help make their life better, not make it harder when things get harder, right? Now, the Bible doesn't say you can't give loans, but you have to do it right. The Bible doesn't say you can't sell to somebody. You can make money off the deal. You just have to make sure that you're not raising the prices when they need it. Why? Because we're part of the same community. Right? So he says, so, verse 17, you shall not wrong one another. Why? Because you fear God. Look at verse 17. I am the Lord your God. He's saying, why? Not because it's right, just because it feels right, but because I'm God. And if I'm God, then who you're selling to belongs to me, right? I was watching a, a famous person who I wouldn't think of as a believer uh, on the internet the other day. And he said, look, I'm really struggling with this idea of a girl being trapped in a boy's body and a boy being trapped in a girl's body. And he said, and I kept thinking to myself, tell that to God. Like, tell him that he messed up. Tell him that he's wrong. Right? And I thought, that's a really interesting thing to say from somebody who is a comedian who normally does kind of dirty movies, right? I'm thinking to myself, that's funny. But then I'm thinking to myself, I haven't seen him in a movie in a long time. And I'm thinking, I wonder if something happened to him where he's looking, he's going, look, the world is starting to get to a place where it's doing what it thinks is right, not doing what God thinks is right. Right? And then we come in and you say, well, listen, as a good businessman, I'm just going to do what you have to do to be a good business person. You go, but if I'm selling to you and you're a part of my community and I know who I am and you know who you are, which is why, in I, which is why identity matters so much. If you know who you belong to and you know where you actually live and you fear the Lord, then you would never try to rip somebody off, especially another believer, because ripping them off would be ripping off God. You'd have to say it to him. You'd have to say, I know that, you know, this person belongs to you, but man, did I get a good deal. 
I mean, can you imagine going up to Yeshua and saying, hey, I, I know that's your son, but man, did I rip him off. Right? No, of course not. So he's saying the rules are set up that, and then listen to this, it's set up in a way that even if you don't do this right, even if you mess this up, that at the end of 50 years, it all goes back to him anyway. So you're going to lose your money no matter what. Right? You can't do it. So listen, he says, verse 19, the land will yield its produce so that you can eat and fill and be secure on it. But I say, um, where are you going to eat your crops in the seventh year if we don't sow or reap our crops? That's what we're asking. He says, then in order, my blessing will give you in the sixth year, right? So God will give us more in the sixth year, meaning he will give us more so that you don't lose your money. See, the, I think what happens to business people, they say, but if I'm, if I'm kind to people, then my business is going to go out of business, right? And you go, but if, I, if, I, if you're telling me to do, if Lord, if you're saying to me that I can't gouge the prices when things get bad or when the demand is high, then how am I going to keep my business afloat? And then I'll help somebody go, but look, it's going to affect not only my business, but all the people that work for me and all the people underneath me. And God's response is, then I'll give you more because you belong to me. See, if you're in God's kingdom, you don't have to worry about making more profit because he will give you more blessing. Right? So then all of a sudden you go, oh, so I'm not going to miss out. My family's not going to go hungry if I do the right thing. No. Right? You look at somebody like J.C. Penney. Right? There's actually a person. Right? He made so much extra money that when he tithing 10% didn't make sense to him. And by the end of his life, he was tithing 90% and keeping 10. Because in his mind, I don't need all that extra. I need what I need to support my family. And he lived as a wealthy person, right? But he gave most of it away because he saw, why do I need? If God gave me this money, why did he give me this money? At, for, to be an individual or to be part of a kingdom? So if he gave me extra, the question is why? What's this extra for? And what's amazing is, is as you see people go around, if you have an entire community of people, when I have less, you might have more. And when you have, I, when you have less, maybe I'll have more. And when we're treating each other fairly and rightly, and we all see each other with the right identity, then all of a sudden our needs are met. And then we're not worried about where we're going to go or what we're going to wear or what, or, or what we're going to eat because we're a part of a community that's going to make sure that we get our inheritance. So look at verse 23. The law, moreover, shall be that you can't sell it permanently. So here's the thing. This is God's land. He's going to say, for this is land is mine because you are, and here's the identity, you are actually aliens and sojourners. And really, there's two words there. Um, one, they both really mean sojourners. They're just a different amount of time, right? So he's saying, ultimately, we're just really passing through. You can see this in Jeremiah, you can see it in Ezekiel, you can see it in the New Testament, that we are only here for a short time and it doesn't really belong to us. None of the things that we have actually belong to us because if God is the God of the universe, then it all actually belongs to him. And so he's saying, for you to understand your place in the kingdom, you have to know that you're an alien and a sojourner in what's really his. So even if he gives you a place to put your head, even if he gives you a home, even if he gives you resources, even if he gives you, you are not the king forever, right? And everybody knows that at some point we die and you can't take it with you. So he's saying, listen, you are not forever. Know that you are an alien and a sojourner. So kingdom-minded people know that they have to do things in a certain way. But kingdom-minded people also know that we have to rely on the king. Kingdom-minded people also then know, you can add that, that could be the third one if you want to make a list, so the first one is, we know that we have to do it right. We know that we have to rely on the king instead of our own strength. That's number two. And then number three is that we're really just aliens and sojourners. That our identity is actually people who are just passing through. We don't actually live here. This is where we live right now until we get to the real kingdom. Right? The gift that we get by being in relationship with God is everlasting life in his presence. It's not about right now. It's about the kingdom of God, right? So there's a sense of, you go back to the example of, does it ruin your life to have a baby? And I think some people go, well, it ruined my body. And I go, okay, well, right? Um, does it really, though? Does it really get in the way if you're a part of a kingdom? Do you see what I mean? Or is it a part of being a part of the kingdom? Then all of a sudden it becomes a celebration again. I find it really sad that these days, Women in general are seeing it as a negative thing, as a bad thing, as if it's a disease that they caught, as opposed to a celebration of what God has done and the miracles that he, look, there should be a part of you that goes, I can't believe that this works. 
that this is a that this is a thing that it happens that that somehow God produces life through me and my wife like how is that even a, that is something that and then I mean anybody who's seen the process of having a baby at some point goes especially when the baby's being born somebody goes okay this is not possible whatever is happening right now is not even possible but it just happened and I don't know exactly what just happened but whatever it was makes me want to cry and jump and be afraid and all, you get all of the emotions all at one point right and I'm telling you at every birth I've either been to or stand out the door from right because sometimes you're not allowed in there's a gasp that comes into the room somebody goes <gasps> right because there's something that you can't explain about the, 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 just the sanctity of life and how, how beautiful it is when a miracle happens, right? There was all those tornadoes you saw in, um, in, uh, in Tennessee and there was a woman, I don't know if you saw the video, uh, she was in a trailer park, her and her uh, boyfriend and their two kids. And she, and when the, her, uh, not, did they say hurricane? Tornado. When the tornado came, it lifted the, the thing off the ground. So she jumped on her one-year-old, but her boyfriend and the baby shot out the back of the thing. Just, they, they got tossed out. And she said, I thought they were dead. But then the boyfriend comes in and he says, I don't know where the baby, the baby's gone. The baby's totally gone, right? Then they look outside and they had a picture of it that the, that the pack and play was literally wrapped and stuck around a tree. And they thought, baby must be dead, right? Then she said, but then I, all of a sudden, I look over, and there's like this cradle made out of tree, and my baby's there with no scratch on it. She goes, it's like a miracle. And I thought, no, it's not like a miracle. That is a miracle, right? That is like a, your baby got lifted by a tornado and, and placed gently down next to it. I mean, it, like, it doesn't even make sense, and it should change her life that maybe what God's trying to do is tell her something about the fact that she belongs to something else. It's bigger than just her, right? And she said at the end of the, of the thing, it's like, she's like, as if, she goes, it's like my kids are trying to save me. You know, and I thought, well, that's almost it, right? God's trying to tell us something. So the reason for the things in the Bible, the reason for like the book of Leviticus, which we all know Debbie loves, but some of us struggle with, is that it gives us practical examples of what it's like to live in a kingdom. And when you live in a kingdom, you know that you have to make good deals. You know that, that those kinds of deals are not to hurt one another, that it's about not relying on your own strength and your own resources, but the resources are of the king. It's not about living here permanently or setting down your identity in a way that like, you have to set down what people call like my legacy, right? It's about how can I be a part of and contribute to a kingdom because what you find as a kingdom-minded person is it's much bigger than who you are because we're really just aliens and sojourners. So he says, thus, right, based on all of that, verse 24, you are to provide redemption for the land. A fellow countryman of yours becomes poor and has to sell his property. The nearest kinsman should come back and, and buy it, right? Um, or it says in verse 26, or in the case of a man who has no kinsman, but he wants to recover by means and he, uh, to find sufficient for his redemption, that he shall calculate the year of the sale and refund the balance to the man he sold it to so that he can return to his property. And you'll notice that every one of these examples is a way for all the different scenarios, whether you sold it to somebody else, right? Um, and whether the, the, you know, they used it for crops, whether you had enough money, whether you didn't have enough money, the goal is always to get the person back to their land, right? We're, you know, in a few, in a few uh, weeks, right, a billion people are going to worship a Jewish person who lived in Israel before 1948, right? That's a joke. You can hear that, right? Okay. They're all going to sit down. They're going to talk about this baby being born, right? And they're going to talk about him being the Messiah. And they're going to they're talk about this sense of what, what it's like for him to come into the world and lower himself and be this baby. And, we're gonna, and people are going to celebrate. Like a billion people at the same time are going to celebrate, whether it's the right day or not, right? They're all going to sit down and talk about it at some point. Right? And there's a sense that when you think about the fact that what he's doing is he's redeeming something for us, the entire process. He's lowering himself so that we can be a part. When Yeshua lives his life, he lives his life so that he can die, right? Not for himself, but for other people, right? He's not just loving God, he's loving his neighbor as himself. He's taking on the sin of the world. He's literally um, lowering himself to the point of death on a cross. I mean, what he's doing is mirroring for us what it's like to live a sacrificial life, right? It's a sacrifice in itself for God to step off his throne and, and become like a baby, right? But the community then comes in, and then what happens is 
the community, right? There's a census that interrupts what's happening in the world. And what do they have to do? They all have to go back to their own homes. If they didn't know what their inheritance was, if they didn't know who they were, they wouldn't have even known where to go. They wouldn't have known which city to go to. If they didn't know who they were, they wouldn't have gotten up, put on a donkey nine months pregnant, and went to the place that prophecy said it would happen. I mean, do you realize what would have happened if they didn't know who they were? They would have stayed where they lived, in Galilee, right? They would have stayed someplace else. But prophecy says that the Messiah has to be from Galilee, but born in Bethlehem. Well, how's that going to happen? So God says, okay, have a census and go back to your inheritance. So they have to go back to their inheritance. That means the community had to preserve it. Everybody had to know that this actually belongs to Mary and Joseph. This place belongs to them. Whether they have the money or not right now, it belongs to them. And because of that, they went back to their home. They went back to their family and it ended up fulfilling prophecy. So the year of Jubilee does something really amazing for us. It makes sure that we do this whether we like it or not. Now, Israel tends to forget this entire section of Scripture, which is why we end up in captivity. Because God said, you didn't let the land rest, so now the land's literally going to throw you up. Like, because you pushed the land, the land is going to push you out. Right? And that put us in captivity. Right? But the, but the goal for us here is to understand what it's like to, and understand what it means to be kingdom-minded people, to have an identity as an alien and a sojourner, as someone who's passing by. If I look at this as not my legacy, but my moment to participate in the kingdom in which I'm a part, then it changes the decisions that I make with my stuff, right? With my inheritance, because it doesn't actually belong to me. Even though God, now listen, it doesn't mean that God's going back on his promises to Israel. What he's saying is, is yes, you get a place here on earth, but it's not the ultimate goal. And that's the beginning of the concept of the idea of worldly thinking, right? That worldly thinking is about focusing on the world. Heavenly thinking is about th thinking about the kingdom. When you think about the kingdom, then what you're doing in this world is investing in something that's heavenly, not investing in something that's on earth. But we spend most of our time as human beings trying to invest here on earth, right? And we have to ask ourselves the question, if we're only investing in earth, then what are we going to get? We're going to get earth. But earth is ultimately destroying itself. So ultimately, you're making a bad investment. I mean, that's really what it comes down to, is you're investing in a company that's not going to be here in a little while. Right? It may look good now, but it's going to disappear in a while. What you really want to do is put all of your investment into the kingdom, which is who you really are. We don't actually live here. This is just our temporary dwelling place until we get to the kingdom. It's the way we make our decisions. So you see these back and forth. It says, take care of the Levites, take care of the poor, take care of... Right? And then it says, well, what about... Um, someone who can't pay you back, should you charge them interest, right? Look at verse 36, right? It says, now in the case of the countrymen of yours who becomes poor with regard to you, and they falter in it, they can't pay you back, right? It says, don't use your you, um, usury interest, meaning don't gouge them, right? Don't like multiply it so that they become slaves. Why? Well, ultimately, debt is a kind of slavery. Whether you know it or not, debt is a kind of slavery, Right? And the world is set up in a system where it's trying to keep you in debt. Now, this is not a conspiracy. It's on the, the, the thing you're supposed to read before you sign. It says on there they're going to charge you 20%. 20% is too much. Then they're going to tell you, up until recently, that you should only have to pay this minimum payment. Or you don't have to pay interest. Look, every time you go to a store now, what do they say to you? Oh, um, you don't even have to pay interest for a whole year. right? But if you read the fine print, it says, at the end of the year, you owe the interest for a year. Right? Which is how many of us, like myself, got stuck. Right? As I said, oh, I, I don't have to pay interest, then I'll, of course I'll, I'll do the payment plan. I'm loving this computer. A year later, the computer's out of date, and I owe money on a computer that I'm not even using anymore. Right? That's the way the world is set up, but the kingdom is not supposed to be that way. We're not supposed to put people in debt. We're supposed to be declaring them freedom from their slavery. Right? So kingdom-minded people know how to make good deals. They know the, who they are. They know that they're sojourners. They know that they're people who are only passing by, and they know that they don't have to charge interest because they don't need extra because God has already given them everything they need. Right? Now, it doesn't say you can't just charge any interest. It says, no, don't, be, don't charge usury. Right? And someone says, well, can I, can I charge interest? Then the verse 37 it says, you shall not give him your silver at interest nor your food for gain. The, old, the reason you give somebody food is not to get food back. The reason you give them food is because they're hungry, right? 
You notice that in, in Scripture, particularly in the prophets, God gets angry at us because we're not taking care of the widow and the orphan. Widows and orphans can't pay you back. That's the whole point, right? They have lost their income. They have lost their resources. And as a community, they have not lost their hope. If they're an individual, they have, right? If they're an individual and they've lost, now, now they, what are they going to do? Because how are they going to live? But if they're a part of a kingdom, now they can live with the rest of us and they don't have to worry about it, but we shouldn't think that they're ever going to pay us back, right? Which is why when a young widow or an old widow comes up to in front of Yeshua and everyone's having an argument and she throws a coin into, the, into, the, into giving, he stops the entire crowd and says, hey guys, I want you to pay attention to this old widow. She gave more than any of these rich people in this room. And they go, what do you mean? He, because she gave everything. Because she understood that she was a part of a kingdom. Right? So as a widow, she had some extra coins. She threw it in the bucket. Her decisions. And now I would imagine that her financial advisor came in and said, listen, you're on a fixed income. You should not be tithing anything because you haven't had any income for a long time. You're poor now. Right? And she said, I don't know. I don't feel poor. I mean, I'm making all this up, but I'm pretty sure it happened. I don't feel very poor because I have what I need. So I have these extra coins. Somebody else can use them, right? That's kingdom-minded thinking. And that's, that's being firm in your identity of who you actually are. That's fearing God and how we treat one another. Now, I'm talking about treating believers, right? This is within the kingdom of God. Now, this, this passage will say, listen, if they're not a part of the kingdom of God, you can kind of do whatever you want because they're not a part of it, right? Which sounds harsh. But what he's really saying is, listen, as the kingdom of God, we should be living differently so that they will want to live in this kingdom and not in that kingdom. They should want to come to us because we don't charge interest instead of going to somebody who charges interest. Right? They should be coming to us because they see what God is doing. Right? So it says, if a countryman of yours becomes poor, this is verse 39, and regard to where he sells himself to you, what he's saying is, is listen, this is, this is the example of I go to a Chinese food place, right? I eat the entire buffet, and then they come out and they say, your bill is a, this as much as what you just ate, which for me can be a lot, right? And I go, I can't pay that, right? And they say, well, if you can't pay, then you got to come in the back and, and do dishes, right? Now, you would imagine that doing dishes, how much should that cost? Okay, well, an entire buffet, one day of things, so how much dishes should I do? Now, if they turn around and they say, you have to do dishes forever, right? That wouldn't be right. <laughs> they would have to say, listen, we need you to do this many dishes to pay off your debt. That's what it's talking about. So if you have somebody who has to pay off debt and they can't pay, listen, to this is a crazy one. Look at what it says, right? It says, uh, um, if your countryman becomes poor in regard to he sells himself to you and, you and you shall not subject him to slave service, right? Because kingdom-minded people know that we're not trying to make slaves. We're trying to free slaves, right? So he says, he shall be as a hired man to you, and as if he was a sojourner, he shall serve you until the end of the year of Jubilee. And then he shall go, go out from you and his sons with him and his family back to his family, that he may return to the property of his forefathers. For they are my servants, whom I brought out of the land of Egypt. They are not to be sold into slavery. Notice, if you've been set free, then you are free indeed. Right? That's what Scripture tells us. So we're not trying to make slaves. We're trying to free slaves. Right? So there's a sense that we make different decisions when we're kingdom-minded. It's not about being an individual trying to make more money. And not, making money is not bad. Scripture is plenty, has, has plenty of things for rich people to do. It's when we start playing a worldly game where we're trying to gain things for this world, and what ends up happening is, is we forget that we belong to a kingdom, and we actually end up belonging to the place we live currently. Right? We go, well, we can't give because I have a mortgage, and I can't give because I have this car payment, and I can't give because I have to secure my legacy, and I can't give because I can't be a part of what God's you know, doing because how am I going to survive? That means that you're not kingdom-minded, that you've become an individual like everybody else. You actually have become worldly-minded. Right? In fact, the New Testament brings this, brings this up over and over. It says, you, you are no longer slaves. You are sojourners. Right? It says it in Corinthians, it says in, in Ephesians, it says it in Jeremiah, it says it in Isaiah, that we are people who pass by, so we have to ask God to forgive us for our sins and then let him take care of us. Right? It says that over and over throughout Scripture, that this pattern you'll see is over and over and over, that kingdom-minded people make different decisions than people who are focused on themselves. Now listen, our entire culture is about focusing on ourselves. Right? 
It's no longer about giving gifts to people. It's about making a list so that they give you the gift that you want, which drives me nuts. I don't even have to know you anymore. You can just tell me what you want and I can give it to you. I don't have to know anything about you. I go, oh, I didn't know you are into that. Here you go, right? It's no longer about communities taking care of one another, showing up for each other when we're in trouble, showing up to one another when we're sick, showing up to another with somebody when they're hungry. It's not about anymore about right, taking care of one another, we can just send you a card in the mail, right? We've become people who live in our own little kingdoms, which is why we put fences, which is why we have our little, right? I mean, some of the wealthy, look, where we live, right, I mean, where this congregation is right now, you go down the street, every house, you will never see anybody who lives there because they live behind a giant gate. They don't, they don't talk to each other, right? I remember one time we were driving by and there was a little girl selling lemonade, and she goes, sorry, I'm out of lemonade. She jumped on her little mini Cadillac, drove back to the mansion, right? Was gone for 10 minutes, came back out, sold us some lemonade. And I thought, where are your parents? Somewhere in that big house back there behind the fence, right? It was like this weird thing where like we've segmented ourselves in our society. We've separated, we've become little islands and then we're angry when people invade our little kingdoms. But what we have to do is become kingdom-minded people so that all of our decisions become about the community of God and about him sitting on the throne. And when we do that, it changes our mentality, it changes our decision-making, and it changes the way that we, make, we do business. Because what we recognize is that if you're in trouble, I'm going to help lift you up. You don't even have to pay me back. I'm not even going to make money off the deal. Because I know that not only would you do that for me, but that God will give me everything I need and he'll give me double for the years that are, plent that are, that are, that are weak, right? That he's going to make up the difference for how it's going to be. Um, so if you have more, right, look at this. So it goes over and over. So I don't know if you've ever looked at Leviticus this way, that it's really a practical guide to how to live in the kingdom. Because remember, it starts off with when you get there, make sure you follow these rules. Now it even says, verse 47, and this is going to be the last one. Now if it means... Uh, now, if, if the means of a stranger or a sojourner with you becomes sufficient, and a countryman of yours becomes so poor in regard and sells himself to the stranger. So imagine that you're so poor that you sell yourself to somebody outside the kingdom. You've become so desperate that you're no longer relying on the community anymore. You're relying on somebody outside the community. And that person makes them a slave. Then the responsibility of the community is to go and get them. Right? This is like when Yeshua said, listen, I will leave the 99 to come find the one. Right? There's this sense that kingdom-minded people know that not only do we have to treat each other right, but when there's somebody in our community who falls away or gets stuck outside the kingdom, that it's our responsibility to go get them and bring them back. Because they don't know that they have an inheritance. They don't know that God can take care of them. They don't know that they didn't need to sell themselves to slavery. Right? They didn't know that maybe they were so desperate that that was the only thing they could think of was to sell themselves into the slavery of somebody else. But we can set them free, and we can set them free on the year of Jubilee. This is why when Yeshua comes from the desert and he, set, he stands up in the synagogue and he reads from Isaiah, he says that his job was to set the captives free, that he's been anointed to do that, that part of what it was to be the Messiah was to fulfill this, that even though Israel can't really do this, that we fail all the time, that we mess this up, that we want to be kingdom-minded people, but we're stuck here on earth, that Yeshua would do it for us, that he would do the ultimate sacrifice so that he would make up the difference that no matter what we're carrying, he can take the burden. No matter what our sickness, he can take it on his back. No matter what our ailment, he will take the, the trouble and the sickness and the shame and carry it to the cross and kill it forever. So that one day we can stand up and say, we've been set free and we belong to a kingdom. And even though we are only people who just are passing through, we realize we belong to something bigger than ourselves. Something that's greater, something that's more, that's bigger than us. Right? So kingdom-minded people make different decisions than the rest of the world because we know that our Redeemer lives and we've been redeemed. Right? That we are a redeemed people. So look at this. Verse uh, 55 says, For the sons of Israel are my servants. So there are three identity markers in this passage. One is we're aliens and sojourners. Those are one and two. The second is we're his servants. If we remember just those three things, now, I said a lot. There's a lot of information in Leviticus. You have to, I mean, you have, your worship leader has to write a whole book on it and then do a Bible study for people to even get it, right? There's a lot of details here. You don't have to remember the details. Remember these three things. You're an alien, you're a sojourner, and you're a servant of the Most High God. If you know that, it will change the way you make your decisions. It'll change the way you treat one another. It'll change the way you deal with your stuff. 
and it will change the way that we interact with other believers, and we will make sure that they, if they are in bondage, that they would be set free. Right? That if they're stuck, that we, un we get them unstuck. That if they can't get up, we lift them up. If they are struggling, we help them to do better. Right? Because they are servants, because they are kingdom-minded. Right? And as a community, we rise together. Now what's sad is we haven't done this well for a long time. So kingdom-minded people, you can write this down if you, don't, if you need to remember. Right? We know how to treat each other. That's number one. Kingdom-minded people don't rely on ourselves. We rely on God. Kingdom-minded people know that they don't belong to this world. They belong to a kingdom. Kingdom-minded people know that they are part of something bigger, and it's not about us. It's about him. Kingdom-minded people know that, that, that uh, make it possible for people to get out of debt and to be released from slavery. Kingdom-minded people know when other believers are trapped that we should go and get them. Because we belong to God and not to this world. Amen? All right, would you pray with me? Lord God, we are thankful that you give us so many examples and so many reasons to praise you. Lord, you have been so faithful to us. Lord, you have shown us over and over that no matter what we go through, no matter what we're struggling with, no matter what sin we've heaped on ourselves, no matter the things that we've done wrong, that you can redeem those things. Lord, we are thankful that you have gone to your Father's house and prepared a place for us, that there is an inheritance and there's space in your kingdom, that all we have to do is repent of trying to make ourselves stronger in this world and remember who we really are, that we are that we are people who are no longer slaves. And as kingdom-minded people, we glorify and thank you for who you are. Lord, forgive us when we're not looking toward you. Help us to remember who we truly are. In Yeshua's name. Amen.